I am Darude and this is my studio in Finland. This is where my magic happens and this is my man cave, my happy place and it's called Serendipity Studios because often a lot of stuff that I do happens sort of by happenstance, happy accidents just keep crashing it onto each other and uh, I think part of somebody's skill is to recognize when those happy accidents are good something good about those developing them further. When it comes to my studio, this is a purpose-built room. Uh, the back wall there is sort of at, an, um, at a triangle type of thing. It's thicker in the center, thinner in the corners. It's got um, acoustic tiling and stuff inside, and it's got a 40% gap between uh, or throughout the whole wall. And uh, it's designed to angle the bouncing waves to the side walls. And the side walls then again uh, are actually bouncing the secondary bounces behind these little movable walls that are right there looking similar with those gaps. So as we know, the COVID pandemic has kind of uh, made everything music performance wise screech to a halt i've been back in finland since uh early march and haven't traveled elsewhere just around these neighborhoods and maybe helsinki and and back i've had a good bit of time in the studio once i got used to uh being stranded in back in finland uh which has been nice though being able to spend time with the wife and kids a lot more waking up in my own bed every morning and so on so that's that's been cool now that i found the rhythm uh, i'm working on about 15 to 20 tracks kind of depends on how you look at it and i've got maybe seven or eight them of them quite ready and the purpose is yet to be determined it might be that i'll release an album at some point or maybe bunch them up into two or three four track combos and release eps and i'm basically looking for sort of the right vibe with the right track and see who wants to release it or maybe i'll release it myself on my own label or if i find a good partner to do it some other way because um I'm feeling sort of that uh, the record company way is always sort of valid, but today there might be other avenues releasing something as well. So we'll see. But I'm, I've been quite excited because I haven't had, um, well, don't get me wrong, I don't want the pandemic around at all. I want it ending now or five months ago. But after getting used to the idea that it, it is there, um, I've been happy that I have finally sort of also gone to sit down in a studio and try and make music day after day after day, which I haven't had in a lot of years really, like so consistent time here. But at the same time, I've been streaming a good bit and streaming itself, um, just talking to the camera and or playing music or whatever doesn't require that much, but I wanted to uh, make it a little better than just regular streaming. Uh, I've invested a little bit of time and money and effort in some of the gear that I use and then also I've studied new ways of doing stuff and maybe what I could possibly put into the streams content wise and and sort of um, creativity wise so that's taking a good bit of my time as well which I'm really liking doing it's uh, it's very sort of interesting and exciting for me it's it's new streaming wise uh, on Fridays I've done this vibing out DJ sessions thing since um, Walt March something every Friday at 6 p.m. finish time. And then on Mondays, I do in the studio where I show anything and everything in my studio. Like sometimes I'll just show how I tweak this kick drum or what do I do with kick and bass. And that's been pretty fun and I'm, I'm going to continue that as well. Uh, I haven't done the Monday ones regularly now because they take quite a lot of time in prepping. And um, also my Wednesday one, I haven't done regularly now like I did in the spring, but I will bring that back as well more. And the Wednesday one has been a, a chatting stream where I've given my WhatsApp number to people and they can send me questions like that. And I've been calling them, like I've called Russia, I've called India, I've, I've called America, I've called, I don't know, 
many, many countries around the world. And it's been quite cool. And then in the same stream, I've talked with my peers. So I've had a Super 8 and Tab from Finland. I'd had DJ Orion from Finland. Uh, there's been Mayan. There's been uh, Baba from uh, Above and Beyond. There's been Steve Hellstrip, Thrill Seekers, uh, Prof. It's been really interesting uh, sort of catching up with my buddies, but then letting the people, the viewers, sort of sit in and listen in. And they can also ask questions what they want. And uh, that, that's been really a good fun and a very sort of, I think, very, very interesting for the, the crowd as well. Not just me DJing, but having actually interaction with them but, and bringing in some guests as well. When I started making music, I was literally just a, a hobbyist. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know that I would ever be releasing music, nor that I would ever be successful in, in the business. Nothing like that. Uh, my biggest dream was to have a local DJ, because I wasn't a DJ even at that point, a local DJ play my track and I would just see the people's reactions, if there was any, and I would hear how it sounded in a club. And um, well, I got that and then then some. I had a Pentium 2 computer that I basically bought and built for, for school. I studied telecommunication in Turku Polytech. And very soon it became quite clear that the computer was less used for school purposes and more for uh, sleepless nights with music purposes. And my main tool initially was a tracker program called Fast Tracker. Uh, I had SoundForge. There was a f uh, like shareware or freeware thing called Hammerhead that was a drum synth. There was a Rebirth that had two 303 emulators and first an 808 drum machine. And then later they updated so that you could actually have an 808 and a 909. And I used that, for instance, in my initial demo of Sandstorm as the drums and probably like one of the bass lines as well. When it comes to Sandstorm, the first thing obviously people think about it is usually the lead sound, the doo doo doo. And um, that I came up with in already like in 97 in Fast Tracker 2 when I was sort of studying other tracks. And one of them was uh, actually Sasha's track that I've, it, it's a funny story because I've told uh, Sasha about that. Then later I learned that one of the tracks on their album shortly after mine came out was sort of um, not ripping off, but getting highly influenced by Sandstorm. So the circle closed pretty quickly back then. Um, so for a couple of years, that Sandstorm doo doo, -doo sound or the, the riff, the melody was actually just sitting on my hard drive. But then in 99, probably July or, or early August, I just happened to open the file again. I liked the rhythm, I liked the, the melody, and I bounced it out or rendered it out, out of Fast Tracker as audio. And at that point I was using Cubase VSD 24, I believe, and which had one of the first ever plugins and a distortion plugin called uh, Quadra Fuzz. And I put the sound that I had coming out of Fast Tracker and the main melody through Quadra Fuzz which was quite different without the distortion, quite dull, this crappy sounding dull mid bass or something. And then when you distorted it, quadrifies, it became what you sort of know as the, the Sandstorm lead sound now. And then it was really quick, uh, you know, just a day or something for me creating the chords around it. And then maybe like a week on and off, a couple of sessions here and there working on the main main full track and then um, bouncing it, having a couple of my sort of local DJs that I knew played in clubs, but but they didn't really go anywhere at that point yet. It only got where it, it later went when I uh, handed it to JS16 or Jaakko Salovara, now my dear friend, uh, and he kind of took me under his wing and he, um, he had just started a record company, 16-inch records, and he 
asked if I wanted to be his first artist. And uh, I said, yes, uh, we like within a week or so, I went to his studio with my samples, original stuff of the Sandstorm thing, uh, do do do, and then the chords and some other drum samples and some other stuff. And we used his um, uh, Atari ST and Cubase based system, black and white screen at that point. But he's, he had better since he had the JP8080 and the Nordlead 2, for instance. And then he had an ASR10 sampler or two and uh, we recreated the track in there. And the arrangement changed quite a bit. Some of the sounds changed a little. Uh, Doo 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 stayed about the same. And then uh, the arrangement was maybe with the really quiet, long breakdown and build was one of the key factors in addition to the doo 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 sound. It took maybe a week until we had a session where we recorded it um, live off of his um, Mackie 24-8 an analog board to a DAT and uh, all the filter moves, all fades and stuff um, are made manually. Jaco and I both had like our hands on his uh, similar rack that I have there and we were doing the filters and, and snare i think got a little bit of reverb towards the end of a build or filter i don't remember exactly anymore but those are all so real-time live uh things and it was kind of cool the second or third take was the main one that that worked and uh mastering in finland by pauli sastamoinen and then we um or jaco uh, his company sent that to uh some factory for test presses and we got those and started spreading it out to our uh, buddies in Finland and the DJ uh, service in Finland and, and Scandinavia and boom it went to number one on Finnish dance chart stayed there for 16 or 17 weeks in late 99 and, and early 2000. Yeah I guess you could uh, say kind of went viral before that was even a thing um like for instance it wasn't even released in the u.s until i think early 2001 but i was already booked to play in the u.s in uh, i believe december 2000 the first time and it was due to like djs in buying imports of it in, in the American stores and um, then sharing burned CD copies and such among each other. And um, since then, various times there's been movies where Sandstorm has been. Uh, one of my favorites and sort of one of the bigger things for me was when uh, it was in a, in a Nike commercial with uh, like a Kobe Bryant and Le LeBron James, it's this um, puppet animated thing and um Kobe Bryant aka the Black Mamba so unstoppable <sighs> Kobe what makes his dunk so unstoppable who's asking these questions what makes his three pointer so unstoppable nobody knows what I'm not that much of a basketball fan but I'm a fan of those guys and I know how big they are and I know how big basketball is in the US especially and that was a big deal to me Viral wise, there's of course been like potato flute cover of Sandstorm. Or, you know, shower cleaning. <laughs> or whatever. Or like the Drake Hotline Bling music video, but with Sandstorm and him dancing to it and stuff. And. I have very little to do with any of that, but then when those things started happening here and there, we definitely first were wondering what the hell is going on, but then when um, when it started happening, we we sort of didn't try to stop it, and we didn't obviously think uh, too many bad things about it, but we started thinking like how could we embrace it and how could we maybe even use it blatantly because if somebody was talking about my track uh, in any sort of way. And people found it funny that still one new play of the track and one one new person may be finding it that way so yeah uh, the meme thing has definitely i'm sure affected the 200 million plays that it has on uh spotify now but um i don't mind well you know some people try to joke about it uh like make me feel bad about it 
or make me feel like the butt of that joke, but, but I see it this way. I made the track not thinking of any sort of success. My biggest dream was, you know, to hear a local DJ play my track at a local club. And, um, you know, I've had that. And then if in 2020, someone still talks about the track, comes to my gig or now, you know, at the moment to watch a stream, that's basically one more ticket sold or one more fan interaction gained. So one more chance to show people that I'm still active. I still make and play music and uh, I have a good bit of other stuff also existing. So what was my initial reaction when I started hearing my track from everywhere? Um, yeah, I would, I mean, ex acceleration and disbelief, I guess. Like I'd never thought of anything like this would be happening. And I was just making music and having fun just for the love of, you know, tinkering, I don't know. The music video of Sandstorm, it was uh, filmed in Helsinki. It's just around Helsinki and a uh, fun fact, by the way, if you are from Helsinki and you, you know those places, you know that you definitely can't run through the whole video uh, scene by scene in three minutes, 45 seconds, because they are actually various parts of the city uh, and sometimes would take maybe 20 minutes to get from one part to the other one, but they were just cool locations. And um, I didn't have much to do with the concept. Uh, it was my first actual music video that I was involved in. I didn't come up with the, um, with the shoot like that, uh, but this guy, Yuzo Surya, and his partner in crime, uh, Misko Iho, did. And then the, the production company, obviously, and, and them directing it, did all the work. I was just... Uh, <laughs> I was just the artist, I was just the prop. I think it was like two days that it took. It went by really fast because I was so into the whole thing. I was so interested in how music videos are made. And um, it was so much fun. They might have asked me a question, do you want to do this or that? But, and I would say yes or no. But other than that, I didn't really have much to do with the creation of the music video. And I can't take too much credit of it, even if I wanted to. Yes, so I took part in Eurovision Song Contest as the Finnish representative in 2019. And um, what an experience that was. I don't really know what to say about that other than I'm so thankful that I got the opportunity and I'm, I'm so happy that uh, I sort of dared to do it. Because Eurovision has maybe um, a little different tone to it than, you know, what what I do or what people think of me, but, but I, I thought that I, when I got the chance, I need to try it. And uh, I needed to do it in my own way. I needed to do it in a dance music way, but then at the same time, uh, the format of the show and the format of the tracks that are, are the entries, it needs to be under three minutes. Uh, it needs to be pretty much like a pop formula and it needs to be a vocal track. Whether there's little or a lot vocals, that's up to you. But I decided that I'm not going to go and try and fight those limits or anything like that. So I had about 30 tracks in the beginning that I started like weeding uh, stuff out of first. And then I got to like under 10 and finally I got to three or four and then three of which the Finnish nation vote then um, decided that the track called Look Away is going to go to the main contest in, in Tel Aviv. And um, the cool thing about that is that uh, Sebastian Raymond, my, my partner in crime there in um, Eurovision, he would have performed any and all three of the entries that we created, but Look Away is actually written by him. So it was sort of the perfect song because now I produced it, uh, I added a little bit of stuff to it, but, but it was actually his original song uh, demo that we started from. And so we, uh, we got to both sort of give our all and uh, really did the whole Eurovision thing together. And um, what a what an experience that is as an artist. Like I, I've been around for quite a while 
and it still was quite a lot. It was, there was a lot of interviews, a lot of new things, a lot of stuff that I wouldn't have even imagined that would go into it. And um, we did it, we went through it. We didn't do that well in a contest, which kind of sucks, but at the same time, just in general, getting that experience, uh, it was worth everything and more. And um, it's not every day you get to see that kind of production. It's not every day that you are asked to represent your, your country. And um, I'd never change one single second of, of that uh, experience. It was really cool. And hey, your vision is not a political platform. It's not supposed to be that. And it's not supposed to have any sort of um, uh, message in your song or anything like that. And we think that we succeeded in having a message in the song, but it's not a political message, but it's about the world. It's about humans and it's about the nature. And it's about where, you know, sometimes it's a lot easier looking away than acting on something that is wrong. And we, uh, with the song, try to encourage people to not to look away, of course. And, um, it was a really good talking point throughout the whole thing and with the, in the interviews and such. And uh, we're, we're very proud of that. Not being preachy, but at the same time, got a little bit of message in there as well. Well, come to think of it, I don't personally know that many Russian artists or DJs, but names like Bobina and Artie come to mind right away. Zed as well, of course. But my man Prof, aka Vladimir Ershov, who I have the pleasure to call my friend and who is a wicked musician and a talented producer, he comes to mind immediately. And probably the Tetris theme song, um, of which I know a Finnish version with vocals, that comes to mind. And right after it, uh, PPK Resurrection, of course. And hey, the uh, huge Eurovision traditions you guys have, obviously, that comes to mind as well. I'm using a Mac at the moment. It's my uh, MacBook Pro laptop and I'm a Logic guy. I use Ableton Live as well, uh, especially when if I play live stuff, sometimes as a sketch pad. And if I collaborate with people who use Ableton Live, I'm pretty decent using live as well. I started actually with, well, Fast Tracker 2 first, then Cakewalk for a second, and then Cubase VST um, 24 and 32. And uh, in 2002, I went on to be full-time logic guy when I was working with my then producer, J16, and he switched systems from Atari Cubase to Mac and Logic. And um, it was just the easiest collaborating with him. And um, I learned Logic as we were working on my second album and haven't looked back since. I actually do have Cubase 10 and I also have Reason, the latest version, and I can work with those, but Logic is still what I know best. When it comes to monitoring, I love my Genelex. Uh, I've been a Genelex guy since early 2000s and I got these once, or this is 8351 now the second biggest of this series, ONES series. And I got those about three or four years ago. I also have a sub under there. It's the 7370. And it acts as a brain and as a low end extender if I need it. But normally I don't actually have the sub on because this room and these speakers, they go to uh, about 30 Hertz and it's very controlled, really tight. And actually the first pair of speakers that I can honestly say that I I hear and feel the punch of the kick uh, and the definition of the bass like I want to. Like my earlier Genelec system was great, but it wasn't this good at all. But yeah, you know, development, it goes forward. My keyboard here is Nectar Tech P6. Why I chose that when, when I got it a few years ago is because it had, and it still has really good interaction or integration to Logic. It's sort of an auto mapping thing where these knobs here uh, automatically find their uh, parameters on whatever synth or plugin they're controlling. This baby here that you can see the little corner of, that's Moog Subsequent 37. That's actually my only 
analog synth currently and I simply love it, I adore it. Uh, what's amazing about it is of course it's sound but the other thing is that it's fully modern and it is um, fully programmable or automatable from their plug that is uh, in, in, the, in the DAW and also you can use that as a patch archiver as well and it's uh, best of both worlds. The whole front panel is basically digitized and you can tweak that from the computer or send those tweaks to the computer and um, still the sound is warm and thick and analog. This gadget here, this is a MIDI controller, it's called Control Master and it's a custom one made for me, like you can see a little uh, braggity logo there. It looks like an arcade controller but what's cool about this is that this is fully assignable MIDI controller, uh, so you could have for instance uh, play I don't know, rewind or record hit the year, whatever you want to do, uh, or different key commands if you want shortcuts in Logic, for instance. And then this one, this is a, a knob, you know, you put your mouse over something on, uh, on the screen, a knob, you say an EQ or something like that. And then like hardware, you can sweep an EQ frequency, for instance, with this, if you wanted to. Uh, it's really handy. It, it brings like tactile feel to your um, otherwise digital or DAW uh, knob tweaking. On this side, I've got a Nordlead 2 or Nordrack 2. I've got a Motu 1248 audio interface, which is a Thunderbolt 2 audio interface. I got an old AMT8 MIDI interface that is um, an eight in and out MIDI interface. I got my first synth here, Cork TR Rack. It's an amazing synth that I bought probably 97 or 98, but that was my first ever synthesizer. And then there's a Roland JP8080 here. And then in the bottom there is a Cork MS2000R rack version of that lovely synth. And then between those, you can't see it, but there's a um, Grace Design M101 mic preamp that is one of the cleanest things I've ever heard preamp wise. That's actually feeding my audio interface with the signal that comes from my vocal booth there of one of the mics, whichever I choose. And then here I've got a Rode K2 as my voiceover mic, whatever I need to do. Stuff like this, except that now I'm on my Rode, little Rode Lav mic. This is my headphones, uh, V-Moda. I often use M100s when I DJ, but this is a similar looking thing, but these are the wireless ones, the Crossfade 2 uh, wireless, uh, and sound great, feel great in your head, and also being uh, Bluetooth wireless, you can use them when you travel and so on, so I, I like them for both. They sound actually a little different from the M100, but I've used those a lot DJing as well. And here's my DJ setup right now. Uh, I've used this setup for the longest time, I've got a Tractor X1 here for, well, basically track A and B, regular control, and I mix with Pioneer CDJ, I mean Pioneer DJM 900 NXS2, and um, might be going to the V10 shortly, but we'll see. Um, this has been my workhorse first, the original 900, then now the NXS2, and I like it because um, I'm just USBing audio from my laptop straight here to all the four channels and I'm good to go. Quality is great and uh, I DJ with Tractor, so I've been on Tractor over 10 years now. And initially I had different uh, interface for Tractor. It was a thing called Otis, EKS Otis, which is a weird sort of space looking thing. Um, and then on this side, I have a uh, Control F1 for triggering samples and loops for the from the remix kits in Tractor. Uh, they're here and this setup has now been like this for a while here in my studio since actually the, the spring when I've done um, streaming from the studio. Like every Friday I do my vibing out uh, DJ sessions from here. Other headphones, I've got a Sennheiser HD25, the classic. It's just uh, monitoring headphone that I, if, when I need something quick, and then I 
really really like the HD650 that I have actually somewhere under there in a box that I haven't used in a while but they are my uh, reference monitors that or headphone monitors that I sometimes use when I just feel like I can't hear what I want to hear or how I want to hear in the speakers or either the V-Modas or the smaller Sennheisers. Uh, like I said, I'm uh, an Ableton guy as well. I've got a push to for Ableton tweaking and that's about it. I think in the studio here, um, if you look oh, on this side of me, that right there is a Cork Triton 76 Pro. And it is my first big um, actual synth with keyboard. And I used to love that thing and I still do. Uh, I've made a lot of music with it. And now it's been resting up there in, in its very deserved spot. But uh, I also now have a Triton plugin by Cork that has all the same sounds and all the expansion cards. And I dearly love using that. And uh, it's very nostalgic for me to go through those sounds. Uh, you can't see it, but there's also a Cork Karma, the red synth that has actually pretty similar sound stuff inside, but it has the Karma function that um, sort of automatically creates a lot of movement, can create arpeggios and chordy stuff with uh, generated from the your input. In a way, not much. I still. Um, I still love tinkering. I still love listening to a sound, adding a delay, adding a reverb and playing some notes, listening to how the delays play together. Maybe there's some harmonics that comes when I play a melody and I start hearing things in it. Or sometimes I start from the drums. I create just drum works that are energetic and you know, move me. And then I start hearing things in the rhythm, like it drums do some stuff, percussion does some stuff, and then I start hearing like what kind of bass line would fit in. And it's it's not I consciously think this is a good bass line, but I'll just start like playing some notes and figuring out how it would work. And um, that's all sort of the same that I've done always. It's just try, trial and error, trying things out and um, seeing what comes up. And uh, these days, one change is that I'm, um, I work with other people way more than I used to back in the day. One thing is that I didn't have those contacts. I didn't have that many people who I could have worked with. Um, but then another thing is that I am way more comfortable in my own skin or in my own producer skill set. You know, before I would have just directly started just producing and going from A to Z sort of and one go and everything would mesh in in the whole production process but now maybe i divide it a little more to the writing and production and then mixing and whatnot so i i'm wearing a little bit of more different separate hats uh as i make stuff but sometimes i still just you know dig out an arpeggiator and a drum machine type of thing and start doing step recording or step programming and, and, and come up with stuff that way. So I think the, I haven't totally or at all uh, forgotten where I came from or what I back then did, but I've expanded sort of my palette and what I kind of know these days and how I get to certain things better in uh, other ways. My hardware hasn't changed actually that much other than the computers are a gazillion times more powerful now than they were back then and obviously the DAWs have way more different plugins and different options now and I think the main thing that has changed um, music making wise in general is the technology and because of the computing power we can now treat audio way 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 more and mangle it to our liking with rather high quality compared to say 1999 which is really cool but other than that i've never been sort of synth gatherer um i've got my you know five six something here but um for a good while i actually didn't use hardware too much at all but since uh about a year ago i got the sub 37 i've actually started using my other very carefully selected hardware bits as well and I've actually tried to implement them more back into my workflow because 
I've noticed that if I have a hardware synth that I have to commit to at one point, whatever I'm working on it, you know, the bass sound or, or arpeggio from there or this and that, the commitment, i.e. recording it to audio is a big decision. And then it forces me to trust that it's good enough. And then it forces me to, or pushes me to go forward with other things. Um, and um, if I do want to go back to it, of course I have the MIDI and I have the same synth, so I can go back to it, but it's actually a good thing to commit stuff to audio here and there. And I sometimes do that with my software plugin synths as well, because of the same reason. I was thinking of which track I would show to you. And um, here's a recent one. Uh, I don't really have any other reason, but other than I, I was working on it just last week. I did this um, charity thing. In Finland, we have, it's called Nena Paiva. Uh, and it, it's uh, Nose, Nena is Nose, Nose Day. And I think interna internationally in some countries, it's the same thing where it's, uh, it's a charity for children's well-being. It's about, it's against bullying and it's against all sorts of bad stuff that ha can happen to children to, to prevent that and to help them out after the fact. And uh, the Finnish National Broadcast Radio, Ule, uh, has every year this um, charity uh, fundraiser and these two crazy guys, uh, their uh, morning show host, were up 42 hours this time, uh, so they always add a couple of hours to the last one. They, for instance, took tattoos uh, for a good cause. They got their hair shaven, all kinds of dumb stuff. <laughs> and I put my hat off to them. The guys uh, have gathered 315,000 euros for kids in need. And um, I went to the radio station. I sat down with them. Uh, they interviewed me, we chatted for a while. I played this track to them once. Then I DJed for 15 minutes and while I was DJing, they wrote lyrics to it. And then after that 15 minutes, we performed it live. They wrapped it live on air on national radio after having done the stream by that time, maybe 16, 18 hours or something like that. I was very happy to take part in the whole thing and I'm quite excited uh, showing you the track here and uh, playing or showing different parts of it as well. So I'll just play the track first, uh, up to the first breakdown. So that's that. Um, so let me just quickly start from here. We are working on a uh, that's actually a one shot bass sample from my buddy Mayon's amazing sample pack that just came out. Check it out, Mayon Music, and you'll find his sample pack. It's on uh, Alonzo site for sale. This is actually quite a tacky and, and punchy short bass sample, but I've made a bass pad type of thing out of it. I've had it looping and then uh, I've taken the attack out so it does what it does. And then I paired it with this guy. Uh, this is a drone type of long bass note from uh, Silent.
And that's them together. A little bit of noise, delay, reverb, just to add a little bit to that. Then we got a little bit of reverse piano sweep here going on. So the piano consists of three different piano things. Uh, first one is this sampler thing. It's one finger piano stab, old school. This one is Logic's own Alchemy classic house stack. And then the last one is just straight up piano. And uh, it's an amazing collection of piano instruments by F9 Audio. You should check them out. This is called New School Piano, but uh, there's dozens of pianos in this pack and they come with Logic instruments and, and channel strips and they are joy to use and they work really well in sort of this old school setting. A lot of house pianos there from back in the day, but with today's standards sounding really good, punching through the mix and working really nicely. So highly recommended there. A little rim shot there, hi-hat there, close one, snare. Um, snare consists of four different snare drums. This one, the main one, a little bit lower body there, a little bit high end sizzle, and snap attack kind of thing there. This one has no EQ, the next one has this low end cut and this was the dollar one. And then this one is, this one is the high end one. It has high end lifted and just a lot of ringing stuff EQ'd out. The last one doesn't have an EQ. And then together it's this. What they do have is a little bit of EQ here, taking out some of the highs and then three reverbs, one after the other. Don't ask me why, it just sounded good. Next up, open hi-hat, rim shot pattern, and then uh, kick drum comes in. So here the kick has full frequency, but it also has a pair. That's the kick, but it has a little buddy. So it's going after this sort of techno feel, techno way of creating a bass line as well. And then I bounced that out with some distortion and shaper box treatment as well. And this is what you get out without the kick. and with the kick. And then interestingly, sort of happy accident happened when you have the delayed kick going through a distortion unit as well. And when you stop it, but the delay tail continues, it distorts the tail as well. And this is how that sounds. And I thought it sounded really cool. So I'm uh, using that to go in to the bass line, basically. So it's just a little bit of ear candy there. So a challenge with the track was that I initially had all the 909 type drums through a bus that has guitar amp. So there's a distortion solid bus, which is a glue compressor, quite heavily compressing, and then bus driver, which is a saturation plugin and also a multi-presser. Mm -hmm. 
So if you listen to that transition there, the last bar without the kick, you'll notice that the claps are louder and there's no automation there to make it louder. It's just because the kick is now out of that one bus and the other sounds can basically come forward a little and breathe. And then when the kick comes back in, there's actually another clap that comes in as well. Basically should be louder clap, but when the kick comes in, the claps are still a little quieter than they were in the last bar. In some mixes, that pumping would be sort of a flaw, but uh, I like it in this one. It's sort of purposely there. I could get rid of it now if I wanted to after I separated everything, but this actually used to be the difference, maybe like six or maybe nine dBs or something like that. It was so distracting and so big that it w wasn't working. But now that it's just doing a couple of dBs and you notice it, but it's sort of there on purpose. So I like it that way. What else do we have? We have loops. So this house loop two, it was one loop, but I made uh, separate tracks for all of the separate sounds. The reason being that some of these have some ringing frequencies that I didn't like. So now I get to separate them in audio tracks and EQ how I like, but also because now I can tune the various drum hits how I want them to. They were not exactly fitting the A minor that this track's key is. And I've used Waves Torg for that, which is a really neat plugin. For instance, here around the 400 Hertz, I found that is is ringing, like there's a resonant frequency that is then a semitone low. I determined it's G sharp. So I pushed it 60 cents up. So leaning more towards the A, that is the correct note. And uh, sometimes you can, or this can easily detect the fundamental or another harmonic, and then you can tune it. Sometimes it won't. Sometimes you need to point it to the plugin yourself and then you tune it where you want. And sometimes you just tune it by the ear. The numbers don't really matter. You just need to hear it. This kind of loop. And I've got some treatment on top here as well. First of all, I've used Shaper Box and I'm taking out a bass note. Listen to this. Uh, I don't need the bass note there and then it's in a wrong key too. So, and I didn't need it. So I didn't need to cut it out and tune it. So I'm just basically EQing it out at that point. There's also some torque tuning on top of this and then another shaper box in the end of the chain and this, and it's only doing it between 2.86 K and 5.16 K. And for some reason, I like the filtered version better. Um, I think that is about it. Oh, maybe I'll show you the effects right quick still. Those are it's very simple in this one. The first three tracks are actually just noise. They are white noise, just because, and then uh, vinyl crackle, if we're gonna hear it. Um, I just wanted to add something old and noisy in this. You don't even notice they're there, but then if you know that they're there and you take them off, you hear it. This track has just a couple of up sweeps like that and this. There's a tape delay plugin, and then after the tape delay plugin, there's a shaper box plugin. There is no pumping, but then when the sound ends and there's the delay tail, this pumping goes up. So the percentage goes to 85. And instead of it being now it pumps along to the beat. I'm also using Shaper Box on the piano bus and then on the warm pad, but not in the breakdowns. And uh, 
Uh, the piano is also a little louder because it needs to cut through better. And it's a little thinner because it's uh, pumping on the ones, two, three, fours. I'll show you my master channel, which doesn't have too much this time around. It has just two dBs of limiting going on right now, i.e. really nothing. But normally I would bounce these two groups, uh, like effects, the kick separately, or loops bus separately, a uh, group of single drums. All the 909s would get, go in one group or one stem, then synths in one stem, house piano one stem, the bass is in one stem, and then there is some miscellaneous stuff in one stem. So four to 10 or so stems per track usually. I put them in another project where I have a template. I probably have an EQ compressor, possibly some saturation ready to go on those buses or stem channels. Not necessarily using them, but they're ready to go in the template. And then I have a mastering chain with, first of all, a gain plugin in the first slot in case I need to adjust the gain so that it's good to or easy to master. Nothing's too hot in the beginning. I've got a linear EQ, can do big moves, high shelf, low shelf, maybe some corrective EQ if I need to, but usually I do that elsewhere. Uh, either in the mixer already before or then in the stems if I need to. Then I will have a uh, slow R comp preset tweaked to my liking. So some something opto probably. Gain reduction maybe 2 dBs tops. Sometimes not even that. After that I usually have a logic compressor. I have a preset made that squashes everything to shit. But I'm only using two, three to five percent of that, so uh, you don't really hear it. But it actually adds a little bit of body and like thickness or something to the sound. Maybe a dB or half a dB of level. After that, I usually have something like Waves Kramer tape tape saturation plugin. It uh, gives my low end a little bit more solidity and roundness or something, and maybe the mids a little width or some magic. I usually don't use the, the woe and flutter and all the impurities. I don't like that, but I just like the actual saturation a little bit. After that, I usually have something like Waves Vitamin, where I can uh, per frequency band adjust width and exciter stuff. So usually I make sure that the lowest of the low are mono. Then I often make, say, 500 to 1000 or a little over that, a little narrower because I often mix it a little wide for some reason. But above that, like 1500, 2000 and above, I usually widen a little bit. And I also often use the exciter in vitamin, especially, and push some of those up, kind of finding a synth sound or a vocal or something like that that needs to cut through, push them up a little bit. Uh, it doesn't usually affect too much of the levels, but it brings up those ranges or those, uh, say, synthy sounds like I want them to. And after that, I'll usually have Isotope, the Maximizer 9 in uh, transient mode. And uh, I don't like to cross my stuff too bad. I'll, uh, I'd rather have it a dB or two quieter than others if it preserves dynamics or, you know, some detail and it attacks better, for instance. Um, on the screen here, I have tools that I often use in addition to my ears, of course. So first, the volume shaper. It doesn't do anything here other than shows me the waveform. And I like seeing the waveform. Uh, I like knowing that it looks like it's supposed to look. My, I see my kick there. I see everything else sort of not too crunched, but they're where they're supposed to be. And for instance, if you look at that and mute the kick, you see the hole that is left after. If you, for instance, don't see a hole left after you mute the kick, you know that you probably maybe then have too much bass playing at the same time as the kick. Depends on the track, of course, and depends on the mix. But the visuals don't obviously tell you what your ears will more accurately do. But once you've gotten used to listening and seeing these metering tools, it actually does help you getting the mix right quicker and uh, seeing problematic frequency ranges quicker, for instance. I check out the loudness meter. I check out the loudness history as well on uh, Isotope Insight. The, the sound field width is very handy. And also this uh, spectrogram
They have different modes and different angles. It's very telling and I often take a glance at that just to make sure something's not out of range or whatever. And then this total balance, balance control, it doesn't really do anything. It just shows you four ranges and they've analyzed a gazillion of tracks and they sort of have found the average of these ranges and the levels of energy they should have for that type of track to sound good. And I don't religiously believe it, but it actually is quite okay. And it's, I mean, for instance here, if we look at the graph, It shows that my stuff is within the margins, but my low end, low, low bass is actually a little heavy. The low mids a little, maybe not loud enough. Depends on the tracks, obviously. My high mids were a little high, but still within those margins. So nothing that I need to drastically change, but you have sort of frequency content comparison there, which can be very useful, especially if you're beginning your mixing learning. I believe that you shouldn't trust these tools at all, but you can easily learn from them. They show you the direction, maybe what you should be listening to or how you should be mixing. So I like these a lot. I mean, I've been around for a good while, but I still use all of these. I mean, anything that makes you notice something that you might not notice. Otherwise, sometimes your ears are just tired and you don't get something. So they help a little bit, but it's obviously the ears that determine the actual final sound. And yes, my, my left ear is not that great. I've had like, um, viral infection or a blood clot in the inner ear and it messed up the whole ear. I hear about up till 1k about normally and then it goes down like this at 4k minus 30 dB at 8k at 60 dB. Yeah it was like 17, 18 years ago and the doctors really don't know other than something just messed up something there and it's uh, irreversible. But luckily I hear stereo, luckily I hear decently enough direction when I'm making music and such, but sometimes in a loud place, for instance, when people are talking to me, I can't precisely point where the, the people are speaking from or who, who is speaking. And so I actually have a tendency to look at people's faces or especially their mouths quite intently sometimes. Uh, and uh, sometimes people notice that and uh, are weirded out by that, but I just want to understand what they're saying. I always wear custom earplugs that are, you know, custom molds and uh, they're 15 dB filters and they're really nice because they take all the frequencies down 15 dBs, not just muffle the uh, high end like the regular, you know, foam plugs do. Every time I play out, I wear them or every time I even just go into a loud environment, even if it's not a concert, but just a loud, restaurant and stuff and I think my ears are quite sensitive like that and I've always worn the plugs even from the beginning of my career so I try to uh, protect whatever I have left. Uh, in, in a studio I try to keep my monitoring volume low most of the time. Sometimes you do have to crank it up but I don't do that for long periods of time and then uh, I also try to take breaks from mixing do a couple of push-ups here, go have lunch, and I try to uh, sleep well. I try to eat well and um, otherwise take care of my body as good as I can. I exercise and, and uh, try and rest. Mm. Yeah, I know the Bon Funk guys, uh, as J16 was one of them, and uh, we hung out at the same studio here and there back then, and uh, then the Bon Funks and I also toured numerous same festivals in Finland and actually elsewhere in the world as well in well in the early 2000s. Cool guys, very fun guys, uh, down to earth and um, yeah I like him a lot. My collaboration with JS was crucial to my career and it was him who found me and his production help that made me the professional that I am today, made my early stuff professional sounding and um, also fitting the DJ format to begin with you know, because I wasn't the DJ. Uh, he produced and co-wrote many of my tracks, the first two album and working with him, I grew as a producer enough to do it on my own. So starting from my third album, I, I've been the producer myself. Mm. All the early remixes uh, with him would, would have been, you know, missed opportunities had it just been me, uh, because I simply wasn't ready at that point. So I owe him a lot.
All right, guys, now it's rate my track time. Your uh, subscribers have sent tracks in and I get to listen to three of them. Um, I have loaded them here in SoundCloud and I'm gonna take a listen and I'm gonna skip through them like I would any demo or promo track and uh, I'll comment something on them. Let's see. And this first one is by Timo Shaya. That beautiful evening. Here goes. Seems very nice so far. Nice. This is uh, nothing brand new, but it doesn't have to be. It sounds very nice. Uh, nicely selected sounds. It seems the mix is quite well balanced. I know these headphones quite well and I can uh, hear the kick, hear the separate drums and, and the bass line. They're quite in, in good balance. The ARP lead is kind of coming through probably how it's supposed to. I like the chord progression. It's a, a sort of very typical melancholic yet up, uplifting. Um, if I played like a 136 set or something like that, this probably could fit in my set. Nice job. So, Timo Shaya, at that beautiful evening. Cool. So, and the next one is uh, Wanna Cry? I don't want to cry. Uh, mind Manifesting. Let's see what this is like. And this band spread all over the world and lasted for decades, and it was tragic. Since psychedelics are really just tools, and whether their outcomes are beneficial or harmful depend on how they're used. This one, this makes me smile. Mind, ma mind manifesting. Very 80s or very synth wave, like it says, retro wave. Makes me think about Miami Vice. Makes me think about Jean Michel Jarre. Sound wise, seems well selected sounds. Seems quite in balance. The only thing that I thought of as constructive criticism, it's not only because of the wave file seems quite uniform from beginning to the end sort of amplitude wise but i think it would maybe benefit if this track had a quieter breakdown like now it maybe seems that it's ongoing and it might be that it worked better if there was a quieter breakdown you know halfway through where there is a little bit of a slowdown here 
not all the drums were on here, for instance, but but if it went even a little quieter, so you would get like a bit more macro, I guess, macro dynamics to it. And obviously this kind of track doesn't need to have a buildup and, and huge drop, but might be that it would benefit out of a little quieter bit and then back to like final round or two of, but yeah, really nice. Uh, I would definitely have that in the background and chill or if that was performed live, I don't know if the, the maker does that, but it could be cool to see like smooth synths played live and whatnot. Let's see if the last one works. Uh, full Spectre, f &M's Rise of Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk, uh, yeah. So let's see play. Wow, that was nice as well. Not something I would make really, but I would definitely like to see that in a big room with huge low end like sub speakers. There was a good amount of that sub bass and also uh, would probably be quite nice and pulsing. Okay, all of them get four points because I don't think they were perfect, maybe sound wise or arrangement wise, but they were really good and I've got really no bad criticism about them. They just um, just work. Very cool. Thanks for letting me listen to these three tracks. What inspires me the most? Um, sounds inspire me. Like something in everyday life, I hear stuff in things. There could be a background noise, then a rhythmic something like a train, clackety clack, and that triggers a bit of like melody or rhythm. Um, and I need to try and get some of the ambience of the situation recorded on my phone usually. And uh, then I like hum a loop on top of that. So something that I can hopefully grasp in the studio when, when I come back to it again. And uh, it's all about vibes and these moments that are just kind of tiny little sparks uh, that trigger something. My kids and the wife inspire me too. They're the kids singing or laughing, like that's the best sound ever. And you'll never get tired of it. Or when you hear your unborn baby's heartbeat. Ooh boy. Well, there's so many, but I always plug my Finnish buddies first. Super 8 and Tab, Lumisade, Orchidea, Audio Ventura, Lenno, Tom Fall, J16, and then uh, 
Oran one goods one today, uh, Adip Gijoy, Elon Bluestone, Mar Levi, Farius, Ruben de Brande, mm, Raj, Anjuna stuff, Black Hole stuff. There's a lot of Armada stuff that I play, Avanti, Suanda Music, and uh, zillions more in and for my DJ sets. And hey, the old guard is still at it, you know, Gabriel and Dresden, Thrill Seekers, Chicane, Paul Van Dyke, Ferry Corsten, Armin. A, a lot of stuff that I probably forgot a lot of them right now. A lot of good singer-songwriter stuff too. Everyone can now be a DJ and a producer when it comes to access uh, to affordable gear and software. And uh, a tablet or smartphone today has exponentially more processing power than the crappy Pentium 2 that I had back in the day when I started. There's more opportunity to put your stuff out there due to the internet, but then there's also a lot more noise because of that. I th still think that the cream still rises to the top though. Not every artist needs a record company today to make it big as there are direct avenues like YouTube, SoundCloud, etc., and you can get your own music out and distributed to Spotify and other platforms. But I don't know, it's all amazing, but at the same time, I feel that it's made actual pieces of music a fraction of a fraction worth what they used to be. Like, it's not always easy or fair to generalize, but in general, people consume music on a single dose basis these days and um, go, I think, more from hit to hit to hit and care less about the creators behind them sometimes. Personality and uniqueness matters often less than marketing money or gimmicks, but maybe I'm just cynical. I don't know. Uh, why does dance music lack popularity in comparison with hip hop? Uh, does it though? I'd say EDM and house-based music is very high on the charts around the world currently and has been for a good while. Like, while not maybe everyone thinks of it as real dance music, uh, but a lot of the modern pop is straight up dance music production put in under three minute hooky pop song formula. If you think dance music is not popular, look at festivals like Perukaville in Germany where I played last year or Tomorrowland where I played a few years ago. Last, I mean, they're huge, they're massive hundreds of thousands of people per weekend. And there are similar ones throughout Europe and North and South America, Australia, Asia, every continent really. So I don't know. It might sound simple and obvious, but, but I think you should make exactly the music you want to make. Don't think about what other people would like to hear or buy, but make music for you. Because uh, that way you get satisfaction out of it regardless of the commercial success. And uh, if there's commercial success and uh, you get to perform your music to big crowds, get to do interviews and such repeatedly, and you'll be representing yourself, you can stand behind everything you do. You're honest and excited about your music and what you do. And that shows people recognize that. Okay. That's my piece of advice. I play ice hockey. I don't know how many of you do, but um, I think Team Russia and Team Finland have always had great, great battles on the ice. And um, I made my own hockey pucks. So I'm gonna sign one of these for you. And um, let's hope this works really well. And I'll send it your way. Oh no. Let's see. It doesn't work really well. I'll do it better.